Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for being here. I, mean, I just I just spoke to uh, to our, our speaker and said it's unfortunate it's, it is late in the day, but I know you will be an enthusiastic, engaged, attentive audience that will be uh, just hanging on every word as as. Uh, I think it's Bob. Robert? Yeah, Bob, yeah, Robert's the Robert, official. Robert's the official. Yeah. Man, yeah. I did comment that uh, I attended the laser uh, presentation last year at, at oh. Saskatoon, and I, I did find it. it was good. It was a good content and, uh, and a good presentation. So I just set you up to, to meet that expectation. Mm. So the, uh, I'm your moderator, and most of you know me. I'm Lori McMullen, executive director of Christian. And I'll be keeping an eye on the time. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Mr. Robert. From uh, Larry Fish to share with you about being agile. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, for toughing it out this late in the day, everyone. I know it is getting late, but uh, we'll try to keep it relevant, and we're going to leave lots of time uh, at the end to to not only go through some actual demonstration aspects, but actually to to have some Q and A at the end too. Um, so today we're here to talk about uh, not just ECM, uh, but we're going to talk about what's known as agile ECM because. Um, frankly, ECM isn't just a requirement anymore. It's it's a fact of life. It's something that um, institutions really in every in every different vertical are going to have to start realizing. But especially something as competitive as higher education, uh, because the you know the fight for new students is becoming harsher than ever. Um, we'll also look at some third party reports that have been done recently um, that kind of show some best practices. Uh, with people in the States. So let's dive into our agenda for today. <clears throat> First, like any good academic presentation, we should probably define our terms. Uh, so we'll start by going through what is ECM? What do I mean by it? Um, you know, why, why is there this um, inevitability in implementing some kind of a content management strategy? Um, we're gonna go through the three, what I would consider basic elements of agile ECM. Uh, then we'll look at this third party um, study that, that literally came out, I think, three weeks ago, and look at some best practices of what different institutions are doing in the United States uh, right now in employing a successful uh, shared services model uh, using an agile approach. Uh, finally, I'm going to go through some demonstrations to actually show how this approach works or can work theoretically in real time. And then we'll go over uh, finally how to successfully do these implementation strategies. Wonders of technology. So with that, we'll go into uh, what do we mean by ECM, first of all. I, I of course, mean enterprise content management. Um, when we look at the history of, of ECM, it used to be basically document management, or just DM for short. And really, as early as the 80s, people realized that shared drives alone just weren't going to cut it in terms of security, in terms of protection for content that was confidential, especially for these organizations that dealt with very confidential content, things like military and law enforcement, uh, even as far back as the 80s realized that they needed a better way to store their electronic content. Oops. Sorry about that. My VPN likes to go in and out. So even as far back as the 80s, we knew this. And we, document management encompasses basic things like storage, uh, search retrieval, um, archiving, you know, basic fundamental document management aspects. And these are all actually in every ECM in some form um, to this day. And that's not to say that this is more basic functionality, but really the technology has come to the point that they've had to come up with this different acronym, which is ECM. And the reason for that is primarily things like business process management. So we're looking at things like automated workflows, um, streamlining business processes. Uh, people have realized that knowledge workers' time is very, very important to maximize. So the more you can actually automate these menial kind of repetitive tasks that take up people's days, the more value you're going to get for you know each dollar you're spending to employ that person. <coughs> Finally, um, you know we're also looking at things like records management uh, because different documents obviously have different um, specific policies surrounding them in terms of uh, you know what the document is, how long do I have to keep it for? and what happens to it once I've kept it for that long. That's records management really boiled down in a nutshell. Um, so an effective system is going to be able to automate that as well for your records manager or whoever's in charge of actually um, you know, uh, taking care of these actual retention policies. 
Now, the two kind of gold standards in terms of record man records management certification would be the DOD 5015.2 standard. Uh, it's stand DOD stands for Department of Defense, so it is a US standard, but it's become the de facto gold standard throughout the world. Um, in terms of security and integrity, any electronic records management solution that is DOD certified is, is pretty much as high as it gets. The other main standard that people look to is the Victoria Electronic Records Standard, or the VERS for short. Um, there are a few other ones that are out there. Um, the Canadian example that's probably the most relevant is the ERDE, or the Electronic Records as Documentary Evidence. Um, but the DOD certification actually supersedes the ERDE, so if anything, it's overkill. But if you're worried about your the content you're storing actually being admissible in any kind of legal discovery situation, your bases are covered unless there's a specific law that states you actually need the physical uh, document, which for some specific instances, that's still the case, but the laws are obviously changing every day as well. Finally, we get into the idea of web content management. Um, we're moving towards more online, more mobile worlds, so people are expecting more services to be provided on websites through um, you know, whatever device they might be, they may be carrying at the time. So things like online portals, forms, um, anything has to be ac accessible remotely. And people not only want to search and retrieve, they actually want to participate in a process completely independent of any physical environment. So these are all the components that go into ECM. Um, the Gartner Report, which is one of these third party research groups that ranks all these uh, different ECM vendors. Um, breaks it these four breaks it down into these four categories, um, and this is changing as well as is their definition of ECM. As the different types of content, the different types of information that we're dealing with also tend to change over time. In addition to Gardner, too, if you want to look at other kind of uh, third-party research, uh, Forrester is another one. Uh, Infotech is a Canadian example out of Montreal. They're very good. Um, they do yearly updates, not only on ECM vendors, but also on different industries as well. If you're looking at, you know, um, doing some background research on any of your actual vendors. So why is ECM essential um, to the organization, to any organization? Um, well, basically information is kind of increasing at a rapid geometric rate. Um, uh, there's a concept called Moore's Law, and it was originally it was originally stated to um, talk about the number of transistors that went into integrated circuits. Um, the person that originally came up with it, I guess Moore, said that every, about every two years, the number of transistors on these circuits would double. And Moore's law has actually been applied to a lot of different uh, pieces of technology. Uh, basically, like computer processors, uh, speed of microchips, things like that, all tend to basically increase at about 50% per year. And information is no different. Information in general in the world is actually doubling about every two years. And in fact, that number is actually shrinking to the point where information is soon going to be doubling every year. And more and more of this information is coming in as completely unstructured data. Things that we wouldn't even have considered keeping as business records you know, 10 years ago, things like you know, any social media or you know, tweets or things like this weren't even things you know, 10 years ago, and now they might be actually critical to a business process going forward. So um, this number is getting scarier and scarier, especially if you don't have an actual tactical approach for being able to handle this. Um, so if you're still trying to combat this with a manual paper-based process, then quite frankly, either you know, you're just not gonna be able to keep the cost down or your competitors are just gonna be that much more efficient and you're just gonna lose. Um, any competitive advantage you might have. So there's three real approaches that you can take. Uh, the first is kind of the most basic, I would say, document management approach, which would be um, simply looking to capture all the information that's coming in, um, store it somewhere safe, uh, manage it, and then deliver it in some function. Obviously, this is this would be what we can, would consider a very basic document management type approach. Not that that's bad as a phase one, but really that should only be kind of a phase one of any kind of a project like this. And this is more for if you're going from a very paper-based, very manual solution right now uh, into an electronic for the first time. Obviously, if we extrapolate this further, we can go into the actual ECM approach, which would be to 
not only uh, start storing the content in a centralized way and capturing it in a digital setting, but also to align it with business processes in a way that is going to help streamline these processes and makes more sense um, from that standpoint. And finally, and what's going to be talked about today, there's the agile approach. Um, and we're going to get into this obviously in a lot more detail, but the agile approach should be used as more of an integrated piece of middleware and also uh, a centralized point of control for the entire organization. So you shouldn't be looking at ECM in a very narrow focus. You should be looking at ECM as a tool that can be applied in a lot of different areas for the same over for the same underlying investment. So the three main aspects of Agile, um, because Agile can mean a lot of different things. It can mean just general flexibility. It can mean an actual methodology in and of itself. Um, but the three main aspects as it applies to Agile ECM would be, uh, first of all, that it does act as a central point of control. And this is important um, from an organizational standpoint, because when you start centralizing the information, it becomes much easier to actually manage the security uh, around that information. And especially if you have a successful agile approach, an agile ECM solution, you're going to be able to control different groups access to different pieces of information. So to the point that you can benefit from uh, knowledge sharing that can happen, but also you can keep, you know, the confidential stuff hidden from those users who don't actually need to see it. But also when you start centralizing the information, you're getting away from the whole idea of silos that might exist in different departments that if left on their own are going to come up with their own specific you know, processes and ways of doing things. So this is a way to start standardizing and streamlining the, the enterprise in general and start doing things like um, coming up with universal folder structures, uh, naming conventions, um, classification schemes. These are all huge value adds when you start harmonizing them between the departments rather than having to manage all of them as independent units um, throughout the enterprise. Finally, uh, central point of control really does have a huge benefit when you start talking about disaster recovery plans as well, because it's a lot easier to back up, you know, one centralized repository rather than it is if, if all of these information, all this information and content is spread out across uh, all these different applications across all these different departments. Um, for the second point, and all of these are kind of correlated as well. But an agile ECM should function as a piece of integrated middleware. Um, what we mean that by that is that uh, to be truly effective, you want your end users to buy in with limited, uh, you know, with limited training, limited hassle. Ideally, this is a project that should make people's jobs easier to do rather than, than them having to actually learn um, any, you know, um, any new stuff that's going to take up a lot of their time and, and make their job fundamentally harder. Um, so to that end, if you already have applications that exist in these different areas, and obviously everyone has applications um, across the enterprise that they already use, things like uh, CRMs or ERPs, or maybe things like accounting softwares, if these are already in place and effective, then great. Keep letting the, let the people in those line of business departments keep doing what they're doing and let, let the ECM act as, you know, draw from these applications and then store the information on the back end if that makes more sense, or do the work in the ECM and let it update these other applications if that makes more sense. Really, ideally, you have an ECM solution that can go both ways. It can push or pull information, but really the idea with any piece of successful integrated middleware is that you want to get away from the idea of duplicating data altogether. You don't want people to have to do something in the accounting program and then go update it in the ECM. That would be you know, the, the opposite point of this whole thing. And finally, and this is the one that we're going to focus on more today, is that an agile ECM solution should be a component of shared services, which really means that for one underlying piece of architecture, you'll be able to apply to different processes in different departments that might have completely different approaches, use different content. Really, it doesn't matter what the content is if the ECM um, is, is set up in the right way. That makes the most sense. And then that way, all of these different departments can actually leverage the same investment that you made initially, maybe for one area. And also, uh, rather than an ECM being an ROI kind of sink, it can actually be an ROI multiplier because you're not actually having to have significant you know, reinvestment every time you expand the project into a different area. 
So getting back to this, to this idea of integrated middleware, we get the idea of the composite application, the one that's going to try to unify all these different uh, departments, all these different applications, all these different workers uh, in the enterprise. And it really doesn't matter what it is um, and what these different elements are. Ideally, um, it's going to replace some legacy systems, not necessarily uh, draw from them. But in, on the other hand, if they're in place and they're doing well, then that's fine. Especially if it is a database that's that's current and up to date, then why you know why try to replace that information somewhere else? Why not just have your piece of middleware draw from that from that database? And again, uh, these are four different examples of processes that could be you know could be used under one application, but really uh, the sky is the limit. And and we don't pretend to know all the different processes that you have. You know, it's up to you to decide. What are the main pain points? Where do I want to start a project like this? And uh, what scale do we need to ramp this project up? Because as we'll get to later on, it doesn't make sense to try to roll this out on an enterprise level right off the bat anyways. And the idea, when we get into it, uh, this, this is really just hammering the same point home. You can have the same basic foundation. Once you've figured out how a process can work, the basic steps in any process generally follow some kind of the same pattern, uh, despite what the content is or what happens to it after the fact. Those are all things that you should be able to configure. Uh, and not only should shared services be applicable to these different departments, it should also be flexible enough so that if a process changes over time, you can change you can change the process around that as well. Uh, because uh, quite frankly, technology is changing at such a rapid rate right now that uh, no one knows what what it's going to look like even five years from now. So you need a solution that's going to be able to change with the times and stay uh, stay current as well to all the changing uh, to the changing landscape of information that's out there. So getting into another report that that again just came out a couple of weeks ago, and I was going to print off copies, but in the interest of being paperless, um, my email will be on the final slide. So send me an email if you'd like a PDF of this report, but. This is a snapshot of the Center of Digital Education released this report, which basically um, went into these different universities that are all uh, successfully implementing a shared services model using, using an ECM. Um, so you'll see that these are three, three good examples because they're all universities of, first of all, significantly different size, and they're all using it in different ways in different departments. But you can see that um, a successful shared services model is going to be able to, um, you know, keep, help you stay competitive in the times of increasing student costs, increasing tuition. Uh, the idea is you want to try to keep costs down because demand for services remains incredibly high. So students aren't going to accept inferior services. Um, at the same time, that's going to require more investment. So if you can find a way to stabilize the investment um, while keeping the secure services at a high level, then that's going to be a competitive advantage against um, the other people in that in that area. And you can see from these three examples that this can benefit everyone from very small institutions to uh, incredibly large institutions like like Texas A&M. So th it's a it's a very good report. It's fairly fairly short as well, but uh, this is what other people are doing. And the, really, the key takeaway from the paper is that ECM shouldn't be looked at as a one as fitting one role and one specific niche. It shouldn't be looked at as a records management solution. It shouldn't be worked at, looked at as like an accounting um, solution. Really, an ECM should be looked at as a multi-department, multi-process approach solution. So with that, I'm going to jump into a demonstration. We're actually inside my VM right now. Okay. And again, this is my company, so this is our ECM. I'm obviously somewhat biased, but again, it doesn't matter what the ECM is. It should have these same elements in it when you're looking at a shared services approach to these different processes. So the first process I'm going to look at in this example would be um, a university admissions example. And when we start talking about, uh, when we looked at those ECM definitions up front, we can see that um, online forms, online web content management is key to capturing information going forward. People don't necessarily uh, want to deal with paper at all anymore. So if you actually give them an ability to enter the information that they need, you don't need to deal with paper anymore. You can actually have 
the whole capture process automated from the beginning. Take all of these fields that will eventually become indexed met metadata and images in our in our document management system on the back end. I, it is an American company, so I do did ask them to change this, but unfortunately, we can just pretend this is a social insurance number. And then, of course, you can also streamline how the information is entered as well in any kind of form. So if a forms tool is flexible enough, you're going to be able to control how the information is coming in, either by using drop downs, by using um, field rules. So you can force people to enter information in certain ways. In this case, if I don't put it in a specific format, it's not going to be accepted as a as a solution at all. And uh, I did live in Ottawa for 10 years before I came here, so I guess I will uh, I will stay true to the senators. And then, of course, any we're trying to make this as similar to any web form that people will see. The other key to any forms package is you shouldn't have it uh, have proprietary software on the back. You don't necessarily want people knowing what e your ECM is. They just want to know. I go to this school's website, I click this link, and it takes me to a form with their own logo with, that resembles the rest of their website. And then we can just go through and actually you know, fill out the rest of this form. And again, I didn't put any specific rules on these, but I could have if I needed to. And certainly, if you're trying to standardize forms at this level, especially ones that are facing you know, the general public or students, you're probably going to want to put more rules in place than less. And the other nice thing that you can do with any kind of uh, workflow, really any kind of business process, is start making the rules in place to uh, make people's jobs easier. So in, in this case, when a student applies, if you want the rule to be that a unique student number is generated, uh, that can be done for you. If you want the student to be emailed, uh, asking them for more information, if they need more information, um, that can also be emailed as well. Uh, I should probably use my own keyboard. That would help. So, and then of course, any any form that's successful is also going to have dynamically populating fields. So, in this case, if I select yes, something shows up. If I select no, when you start putting online forms on, they should be dynamic like this because you want people to be able to do things like add their own supporting documents. If they need forms to be very long sometimes or very short other times, your form your form modeler should be flexible enough to, to capture that information despite, you know, no matter what they actually need. And then the person fills out the rest of their application. If they needed to add any kind of supporting documents, those could be added as well. And really, because you're trying to, oh, I didn't put enough numbers there. And because we're trying to streamline the process and make buy-in from the end users as easy as possible, anytime you actually need people notified, makes the most sense to maybe send an email if it's something that doesn't happen, you know, 50 times a day. So someone in this instance could just open up their email and actually have some kind of a task or some kind of a notification waiting for them. In this case, the actual student themselves is going to get um, going to get an email back. And it's you can see that we can generate this unique number and you can come up with the, the rules for how this number is generated. So once the student number is actually generated, we can also actually point the student to other, other forms that we actually need them to fill out to, to fill the application. If you needed that first step to go through an approval process, that might be a way to set up the, the, the actual workflow. But the idea is you want to make it as flexible as possible, and you also want to make the actual filling out of these forms uh, as fluid as possible as well. So in this case, rather than having to go through and actually fill out all my contact information, you could actually have just these numbers set up. So what, when you put it in, it actually just auto populates as well. Um, and a lot of organizations are already doing this uh, with things like um, just employee numbers. So if they have internal forms like expense reports or uh, vacation requests, any kind of internal HR type forms, it makes a lot more sense to plug in your number and then just put in you know the specific information you're looking for rather than having to go through and actually fill out all of your contact information each time. And again, we can run the rest of the process from this point on. Uh, and really, in the background of all this, we actually have everything being stored in, in a centralized repository um, that's, again, accessible by only those who actually need to, to see the information that's being shown. <clears throat> 
and you can see that we can really just send this information anywhere that we need to. Um, so student records might have might have a section for uh, for any of the applications that actually came in at this point. So if I go through and actually fill out the rest of this, let's say that Daniel was a very good student. What does Ottawa you use for GPA? Pardon? What does Ottawa you use? I went to Carleton. Uh, full uh, full disclosure. So when I go through and fill out the rest of this form. Really, you can also set it up so that people can, you know, what, the application is only considered successful once it's actually gone through all the different forms and any kind of approval process, workflow. These are all things that you can automate from a high level. Uh, really, really from a CIO perspective, you should be most concerned with looking at something that looks like this. Um, this is actually a gra graphical, our own graphical interface, but it's built on the Windows workflow engine. And the idea is that you can make any number of different workflows for the different processes that happen um, in the system. A form is one way to capture that information on the front end, but another way would be to scan in a batch of documents or maybe even just drag and drop a number of documents in as well. Uh, but really, th the idea is you want a tool that's flexible enough that you can make changes as they happen. So admissions might have something that looks like this as a workflow. Whereas uh, something completely unrelated like accounts payable might have something that looks like this. But the idea is even if my process changes, I can change with it. So if I, for example, wanted to add something like an email notification, um, if I could find it, then I would just be able to make changes as they happen and publish my results. Now, in a perfect world, you're also having a safe environment in order to test these changes before you actually roll them out. So it's nice to have a kind of sandbox environment for either your people in IT or the people that are actually designing these workflows from the top level to be able to go through and actually, you know, build them out. Um, really, the toughest part of building any of these processes is actually sitting down and looking at a high level um, with a pen and paper and saying, what is our current process right now? What are we doing? A lot of people are surprised to learn that it's incredibly inefficient when you start looking at it, even from this level, and you can start streamlining a process before you even start talking about software or technology at all. So looking at another com a completely unrelated example, um, and again, this is going to go back to the shared services idea, um, we could look at an accounts payable process um, as well. This could also be captured in a form, or we could actually have um, someone scan in a number of uh, a number of invoices or something like that in this example. So regardless of how you're getting the content in, uh, because let's face it, paper is still a fact of life for people and it's not going away anytime soon. So we do still, still need a way to handle paper that's incoming. So even if we can't capture it in a form, our vendors might not you know, be that on the ball. They might not be using electronic documents. But either way, you have to have some way to automate the actual capture of this paper to index it and then to put it into your, to your document management system as well. So now that we've scanned, in this case, I'm gonna kind of skip through this. This is our automated capture tool, but really this could be something like Cofax. This could be uh, if on the very, very high end of volume. This could be any number of different capture tools that are out in the market. But however you actually get this digital content into your repository, into your ECM solution, this can actually kick off any number of different workflows from this point. Well, now that we're talking about streamlining a paper process, we've converted the paper initially at the front end into a digital setting, and now we can actually start building out what happens from this point forward. So this is the same fundamental architecture that happened before. We're actually still using uh, email notification to actually point people to their next role in the actual process. So this could be an email that's generated to someone who works in accounting. And if that person in accounting actually log in to their version of the repository, it might look very simplified uh, versus someone who is like an administrator or something like that. So when I log in, um, again, you can make people's views very small, very large, depending on how much knowledge sharing you actually think will benefit the actual end user. Um, if you think it's more beneficial for them to only really have access to that which directly applies to their job, then maybe that's how you have set it up from a security standpoint. Um, and which makes sense as well. 
And again, going back to uh, the DOD certification, any, any successful ECM that you do implement should have a full auto trail um, capability as well. Because just in case anything happens in any kind of legal discovery situation, you do have to be able to actually point to a detailed report saying, here's, a, here's an absolute history of everything that's happened to my information um, since it's been in my system. And again, uh, if you are relying on people being mobile mostly, email might make more sense, or people can just access the same content from their device or, or um, any internet connection that they might have. So the workforce is becoming increasingly more mobile as well. Students, of course, all have their own devices. Um, so this is gonna become more and more important. But people wanna be able to access, quickly access the information they want, and you want your knowledge workers to be able to quickly make the decisions based on that information to drive your different processes in the different departments. So if it's an accounts payable example, you might have something go to like a pending approval folder. So um, the other thing you can have is that even though this is the same architecture that we use for student admissions, in this example, when the invoices come in, we're actually having, having it automatically match our invoices to purchase orders that either might be in our accounting application, might be in a database somewhere, or they might actually already be in our ECM solution if that's where we're that's where we're storing them. So if it's successfully acting as a piece of integrated middleware, um, it's going to be able to leverage that information that already exists. It's gonna be able to do things for the accounting clerk like link it to the purchase order automatically. Uh, potentially in this case, in the actual metadata itself, it's gonna be linked. And also to make it much easier to, to get buy-in from your end user, you should also make any of these processes as transparent as possible. So. In this case, you can see that you can actually leave instructions, explicit instructions telling people not only what the process is, how long it's been going for, any kind of analytics based on the process itself, but also what the person's role is next. So even if, even if the person isn't clear on what they're supposed to be doing with this, you can explicitly um, try to make it as idiot proof as possible by leaving explicit instructions and letting the person actually just get to, to doing the meat of their job rather than spending a lot of time looking for the corresponding purchase order, wherever it might be. <clears throat> and you can see that this clerk could then just quickly go. And, and content can come in many different ways. There can, it could be a PDF, it could be a TIFF. When you are looking at storing content long-term, you will want to store it in one of those two formats because they're considered more secure in terms of archiving, in terms of their actual images of documents rather than something like a Word document, which isn't as secure a file type. Although I will say that TIFF is, is generally better from an organizational standpoint, only because it is non-proprietary. Um, not that Adobe is pretty friendly in terms of that, but it is frustrating if you don't have the latest version of Adobe uh, installed on whatever de device it is that you happen to be accessing it from. And if anyone's loaded like a 500 page PDF and crashed their machine before, we've all been there. Whereas a TIFF generally only loads one page at a time. Even if it is like a, a 10,000 page image, it's gonna load just as fast as a one page image will. And in terms of storage space, when you start getting into the millions of images mark, uh, TIFF is about 40% lighter in terms of storage space. So something to consider. I mean, some people love PDF and that's fine, uh, but TIFF does offer its kind of unique advantages. And then in this case, you could actually just run through any kind of an approval process and then have whatever the steps are that happen afterwards uh, take place automatically. So you can see in this case that it disappeared from pending approval folder and we've created a new vendor folder for it in the invoices folder. Now, the other nice thing about the shared services model is that um, not only can this apply to different pro processes and different departments, but a successful and really flexible agile UCM approach can also apply to different individuals that might be involved in the same process. So in this case, someone in accounting might want the information organized in this kind of way. They want their invoices, their checks, their folders, all organized by the company or the vendor. Whereas someone in involved with records management might want to organize in a completely different way. So we call this, we call this concept transparent records management. Because the idea is you're trying to make it as easy as possible for your end users to buy into whatever compliance, whatever regulatory standards are actually in place for the different document types, the different information that they're actually dealing with. 
but we're doing it in a way that's not intrusive to the way that they do their job. So you can see that that person in accounting can still organize the information in the way that it makes sense to them, whereas the person in, involved in records management can actually have the same information but displayed in actual date series based on when it came in. And the way that you can do that without actually duplicating the data is by creating virtual shortcuts to these documents. So you never want to have more than one copy of anything really in your system. That's the whole point of centralizing it. But the idea is you can now create as many virtual shortcuts to these documents as are required. So people can be free to set up their folder, set up their content in a very specific way and then just have mirrors to wherever the records actually reside in, in maybe a record series somewhere or something that might be governed by specific retention policies. And again, any kind of really agile ECM approach is going to be a, is going to automate things like how long, you know, what kind of document is this? How long do we have to keep it? Are there specific um, legal requirements that have to happen after we've kept it for a certain amount of time? Um, really it should be flexible enough to, to encompass anything and the thing is that these laws are changing constantly as well for different documents that were never considered records in the past new laws are always being developed giving us new uh new laws and new regulations around them you also have to do be able to do things like place a legal freeze on a document in case someone sues you and it hasn't reached its retention you have to be able to freeze these documents uh, until you know the, the legal proceedings are actually finalized in terms of reporting, you should also be able to set up your agile approach to automate things like reports. You should be able to actually keep track of metrics of the different users in the system. So I want to be able to see who's the most efficient at this process between the three clerks I have assigned to this you know, particular role. Um, I also want to see identified bottlenecks within the process. So if I've set this up and you know the first stage of approval takes only a day, but the second stage takes three weeks, you know, you can much more easily decide from a high level, well, should I dedicate more resources to the second stage or what is the issue? You can start, you know, fact finding a little bit more. But if you have these reports coming to you automatically generated in just nice, nice, neat tables, then you're not wasting a lot of time on that. And it can be a huge value add as well when you're actually implementing a solution like this. So again, this is a records management approach. Um, and when you do get these kind of reports, this is actually an example we built out for, for case workers, for a case management example. But you might just get something simple like this. Um, and if it's something that's basic and repeatable, any BPM tool will be able to, to generate these kind of reports for you as well. So when we actually go into, and we'll come back to one, one kind of final example, which would be we've dealt with two kind of internal examples up to this point. Uh, we can also deal with like an HR onboarding example. The basic concept is the same. Whereas someone applies for a job, we can put rules in place um, to actually put these applicants to the different jobs. So we're actually streamlining any kind of process by routing it to the right place initially. And again, if you can capture information in any kind of structured environment and different reports have shown that I think uh, one report I, I read said that like 70% of all business processes start with some kind of a structured uh, front end. So any forms tool that's flexible enough to, to create your own forms is going to be able to start streamlining any of these processes at least up to 70% according to this one report. And again, I hate throwing stats like that out without backing it up, but I cannot remember the name of it. So I think. So rather than getting into this example, I, I would like to talk about best practices for implementation as well. Um, so let's go from Krintz. So anytime you're rolling out an agile ECM project like this, uh, you should take a focused approach. Um, truly, the, any of the best ECM solutions that are truly agile should also be scalable by definition. So you don't need to start at an enterprise level from day one. And quite honestly, you're, you're doomed to failure anyways if you try to you know, boil the ocean, so to speak. Um, it makes a lot more sense to take a very focused approach to identify the main pain points, perhaps, identify a key department or, that you want to start this kind of a project in, and then allow them to act as kind of a beta test um, for the solution to make sure that it works before you do start rolling it out to a very, very large audience. So, 
makes more sense to look at, okay, admissions is a huge, you know, drain on our resources right now. Um, why don't we start with admissions and maybe, you know, accounting or something else? Pick two or three, maybe small departments pick a small number of users, and then let them actually become your champions uh, within the organization. Once people realize that you know, their jobs are actually becoming easier and they're becoming more productive, other departments are gonna actually start wanting to buy in on their own, rather than you having to force them uh, into this new project, into learning a new software, a new application. So really, um, by taking a focused approach, not only is it uh, does it make more sense in terms of buy-in, but it also makes more sense in terms of long-term sustainability. Uh, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good the software is. If your end users aren't buying in, it's going to go nowhere as a project. Um, and you do need internal champions that are going to be there as an ongoing resource. And you also need, um, you know, just uh, a technology that's going to continue to improve over time. It's not going to uh, you know, not not give out any updates in 10 years and then, you know, become itself a legacy system. So obviously things, reports like Gartner, Forrester, Infotech, these are the places you should be looking. Independent third party research groups are looking for the vendors that are on the leading edge for these kind of solutions. And it is a, you know, it is a tremendously important decision to make when you are picking the right ECM. You have to make sure not only that it's agile, but that it's not going to go anywhere. Um, next door, so it, tomorrow. So, cultivating champions incredibly important. Focused approach also incredibly important. Um, I know it's the end of the day. We could run through a few other demo examples, but I think yeah. I'd like to open it up to any last yeah. questions. I think if, if there's any questions, yeah. Be, um, I'd like to ask you a question, which is sort of what's your sweet spot in a complex marketplace? But let me set some context around that. Mm -hmm. So, um, we've got a strong tool that we like that is web content management for the public facing web pages and it has sort of a workflow engine in it. And we've got our enterprise, our ERP system that has a really strong heavyweight workflow engine as well as some ability to capture some documents in it. And we have SharePoint and we have um, various ways we're trying to get things in, and we can imagine an electronic archives as distinct, you know, in a strong archival archivist librarian sense. Um, and we can imagine um, things focused on an enterprise data warehouse repository that could lean towards structure and or from structured data could lean or lead into unstructured data. So in, in, in that kind of really complex space, where's your niche or your sweet spot? It's a good question. I mean, I don't um, just want this to turn into a sales pitch, right? But uh, <laughs> at the same time, at the same time, I can't help myself. So um, basically our niche would be, this is this year's Infotech report. It's one of these other third party um, research groups that we show. Um, these are considered the major players in the ECM marketplace. Um, in terms of functionality, this is what Infotech is ranking them on. Uh, you can see LaserBeach is a good blend between a leading product and a leading vendor. Um, you know, some would interpret that to, to say that we're the best in terms of functionality, but it depends on what your, what your priorities are really. Um, in, but within this champion quadrant, when we look at another part of this report, and it's like a 60 page report, um, if you want to look it up, you can also see that of those supposed champion groups, you know, the value for dollar um, is, is extremely high. I would say that the main niche that we provide is that we offer the same functionality as these other kind of enterprise level um, software is what we do it in a very scalable um, environment. So we have one user like Laserfish customers, for example. Um, whereas uh, you'd be hard pressed to find like a one user open text person. It's just not possible. So our niche is that when I say you can have a very agile, very flexible approach in one department, I'm not lying. You can start with, you know, 10 people in one department. And then if it's successful, you can roll it out rather than, um, you know, risking making a, you know, half million dollar investment and just going all in on one of these other um, very high level groups that that have a much more risk for failure. Yeah. So the point is, if you're trying to make that these products, other products, are already in your enterprise, 
So, or, or, or they're <coughs> incorrect competitors. Yeah, so yeah. Incorrect competitors if I was doing an RFP. I mean, you yeah, you raise a good point. There's a lot of overlap in a lot of this, yeah. and a lot of different softwares now have like workflow elements. If they don't have it, there's you know there's standalone forms products, there's standalone yeah. capture products. Yeah. This is a standalone solution, but we can do things like integrate with SharePoint. We can integrate with SAP. We can integrate with Salesforce. You know, um, the, we can act as a piece of in integrated middleware. So we're not trying to replace. If you already have applications that are effective in what they're doing, that's great, but we can fill in the gaps where they might exist. And if you're going from nothing to something, then we can fill in almost all of the gaps. I would say that's the approach. And we can do it in a very scalable, um, cost-effective way. But, and again, I'm very biased when I say that. So, um, but let the, let the third-party reports speak from, for themselves, right? I'm going to cut off conversation, but it is 10 and 5, and I know there are birds and feather sessions. So sure. It's not if anybody, I don't know if anybody can take one, but I don't want to stop you from going. <laughs> there's uh, sessions after this? Really? There's birds and feathers, not in current sessions, but there's some birds and feathers. Oh, they, 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 they keep you going from 7.30 to 10 o'clock. Wow. <laughs> so, so with that, there's, uh, I think I will thank you very much. For Perfect. Well, thanks, everyone. Sure you're around at the booth, correct? Or will be yeah, I'm upstairs on the fourth.